Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 51 of the video series in which we program an entire video game from scratch beginning to end in the beautiful C programming language. So what did we do last time? That's right. We we did some we did uh, probably the last of the optimization um, performance optimization that we were going to do um, in terms of uh, in render frame graphics uh, specifically the overworld because that's where the bulk of our drawing is being done uh, we we optimized um, blit 32 bit per pixel uh, bitmap to buffer right right there we optimized it by vectorizing the code and making it AVX uh, take advantage of AVX so and we did get um, we did get a, a noticeable noticeable FPS increase from doing that. Um, you know, you saw it yourself. We started with I don't I think it was like 1,200 FPS, and then after the vectorization, we had 1,700 FPS. So I feel pretty good about that. Now, is it as optimized as it could possibly be? Probably not. There are a lot of nuances. Um, that I didn't account for. For example, um, for example, Mask Store is much more efficient on Intel processors than it is on AMD processors. So, if you really needed to optimize for AMD processors, uh, then you might actually need to figure out a better way, uh, a better way to do this than by using Mask Store, if at all possible. Um, that being said, I don't think that the, considering that this is a very, you know, this, this game is extremely simple graphically. I mean, it's not like Assassin's Creed or Call of Duty. So we, you know, it, it's not a big, it's not a big problem. I mean, I think that we already have this, um, to where it'll run on practically any processor. It will probably run on a one gigahertz. AMD Athlon XP from 2001 and you would still be able to get 60 frames per second so not that worried about it. Um, before we do anything today though we should look at the uh, questions that I got since last time. Uh, first commenter says hello I am new and I wanted to start learning programming so I watched your videos however I wonder if you have posted the codes of the first six episodes because on your github I can't find them I hope I will not give up this long tutorial series thank you um, okay so thank you very much for watching and uh, unfortunately no unfortunately I don't have the first I don't have the code from the first six episodes because I didn't start using github until episode six so unfortunately, uh, you'll just have to follow, you'll just have to um, to watch the videos and follow along that way. I mean, it should be. And you know, if if you can't do that, then at least you know start with episode six, and I mean download the code from episode six, right? Like you check out the very first uh, commit from the GitHub repository, and then you have something to look at while you watch the first six videos. Uh, you have some code to play with on your machine, um, so that's the best I best I got for you. All right. So next comment says the next comment is a doozy. He says Casey Muratori on his Handmade Hero streams had shown a better way of coming up to the fastest possible code, and I'm not sure why he italicized the word way. Maybe he I'm not maybe he meant to say way better. A way better way has shown a better way of coming up to the fastest possible code. I'm going to say what that advice consists of. Okay, make a function call flat, which means you inline everything. Um, then you time your current code, which we're already doing. At this step, you need to measure yes how much time the given function takes to execute. Or some, yeah, we're already doing that. Calculate how much time the function could have taken if it was ideally optimized. Um, 
here you would take a flat code, count how many operations does it perform, then you have to use the intrinsics guide to add up all of these numbers, which he's talking about. I'll show you. Intel intrinsics guide. So you click on these things and actually, there you go. Uh, these latency and throughput numbers tells you how fast the operations are. So basically you add all those up and you, you know, decide that's how fast your, your, your function could be if you, I guess, could reduce it to the smallest number of, of operations, right? And then, you know, three, perform the optimizations. This is what you've shown us during previous two videos. Now we all know how to do it. Uh, and then he says this is a good way of making sure you're actually optimizing code and not just assuming that you are. Uh, I do want to point out, I'm not assuming a thing. Uh, like I've said before, we already calculated our FPS and we went through several episodes detailing exactly how that works. And um, I'm confident in my use of uh, FPS and, and query performance counter. Sorry, I'm trying to find win main here. Um, here it is. There. Start timer. We're measuring window message processing, player input processing, render frame graphics, and then we stop timer. That's what we're measuring. And we're measuring that 60 times per second, and we get a very accurate count of elapsed microseconds per frame. And then we average that over 120 frames, and we so there's no there's no issue of like oh well you know our results are skewed because we're only measuring the faster frames um, that's not true we're measuring every single frame so not a problem uh, he says also a good way of counting actual processor cycles is RDTSC no it's not um, please stop using RDTSC so what he's talking about is it's an intrinsic and it's it returns a 64-bit timestamp, right? So um, you can use it just like this, RDTSC. Yeah, it returns a DWORD 64, which is an unsigned 64-bit number. So RDTSC is a it, that is a CPU intrinsic. Um, however, using RDTSC directly it might work and it might not work it it has nuances and subtleties about its usage that not very many people use correctly and what do i mean by that notice that i'm not using rdtsc i'm using query performance counter and query performance counter is probably using rdtsc under the hood but there are things about RDTSC that make it, for example, if you don't have an inv if your CPU for some reason did not have an invariant timestamp counter, which let me show you that. Tools, CD tools, uh, core info, find string, invariant. So I'm using the core info. Uh, utility and that's showing that I, my processor has an invariant time timestamp counter but not all processors do uh, some processors especially older processors have a timestamp counter that is that runs at the that runs at a dynamic frequency right invariant means it doesn't change right it runs at a constant rate so if for some odd reason you did not have an invariant TSC. In that case, the numbers, the timestamps that RD TSC returns to you, are just going to be flat out wrong. They're just going to be wrong. Period. Now, uh, query performance counter. The way that query perform performance counter solves for that is um, is that if you it, it it checks that same flag with CPU ID that I just checked with core info. And it says, oh, if you don't have an invariant TSC, then I'm not going to use the TSC. I'm going to use um, uh, 
probably probably HPET, uh, HPET, the High Performance Event Timer, which is actually on your uh, chipset, not on your CPU. The problem is uh, the HPET is slower to access um, than RDTSC is. So you would prefer to use RDTSC, but if it's invariant, then you, you can't rely on it because it's, it's variable rate. It doesn't tick at a constant rate, right? So that's one of the things that query performance counter, that's one of the advantages that query performance counter has over just calling RDTSC directly, is that it can fall back to other methods like the, uh, the HPET timer or the, or the power management timer one of those, if for some reason it determines that your your timestamp counter on your CPU um, isn't going to be isn't going to produce reliable results. Secondly, there's something else that you don't like. You can't just call RDTSC directly uh, because, according to Intel, you can read this directly out of Intel's documentation, RDTSC is not a serializing instruction, which means that instructions that are around, that are adjacent to RDTSC can be executed out of order. And when, ex when, when instructions are executed out of order, that means that you no longer know what you're timing. Like, you don't the thing, the instructions that you were trying to time may actually execute after you, you call after RD, after RDTSC and after your timer has, has been been clocked, right? After you've already read the timestamp. The way to get around that is by using fence. Um, you know, you need an, an M fence or an L fence on either side of RDTSC, but not many people know that and not many people do that. Query performance counter does that for you. It, serializes RDTSC for you so if you didn't know that this needs to be fenced then suddenly you have fallen victim to one of the pitfalls of using RDTSC and you think you're measuring something that or you, you think you're getting accurate measurements while you're not um, okay so let me try to finish this comment he says as far as I know every process in Windows gets its own program counter not sure what you're talking about there um, you know, RDTSC, it's it's a timestamp counter on your CPU. It applies to the entire system. Um, there's only one. So I'm not sure what you mean in terms of every process in Windows gets its own program counter. I mean, yes, there, there are per process counters, um, but they measure different things. Um, we're just talking about RDTSC, so not every process, it, like, no, not every process gets its own RDTSC. That's not how RDTSC works. It's um, there's only one RDTSC, and every process accesses the same one. Um, there, there's one on every uh, core, right? Uh, every core of your your CPU. So if you have eight cores, then I guess you have eight or you have eight timestamp counters. Um, okay. So anyway. Um, all right. So, and by the way, all that stuff that I just said is documented. By the way, if you haven't already read this document right here, then please do. I mean, it will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. Um, the only thing that the only thing, only value that I had to add there was like, you know, in typical documentation, in typical Microsoft documentation style, it'll say, you know, you should use query performance counter instead of RDTSC to avoid accuracy or portability problems. But it doesn't elaborate on what those accuracy or portability problems is. I just did elaborate on them, so um, let my advice be a supplement to the, the Microsoft documentation, but please do read the Microsoft documentation. And as you can see, you know their advice is exactly what we're already doing except they're using the kernel uh, kernel mode part uh, kernel mode counterpart of query performance counter but it's the same uh, should I use QPC or call RDC or call the instructions directly and this yeah this is exactly the sentence I was talking about to avoid incorrectness and portability issues and you know portability issues again is like I was talking about earlier the TSC is not implemented the same on all processors so 
that's that's why you that's why it has portability issues. Um, you could take the code to another machine that has a different implementation, uh, and the timings would be different. All right. So, but generally speaking, this is this is fine for our purposes. Now, like, if I wanted to, if if I wanted to time render frame graphics independently and leave out these other two, leave out process player input and leave out um, the message queue. That's fine. I, I could totally do that. I could totally create a separate counter that measures just those if I wanted to. But the reason why I don't is because the only thing in this game currently that has any sort of processing that that, that does any sort of like processor intensive stuff is render frame graphics so like the, the draining the message queue and process player input those costs practically nothing compared to render frame graphics render frame graphics is is where it, where it is is all at and um, to that end I, I since we're talking about performance I'll go ahead and show you the tool uh, one of the tools that uh, Visual Studio has built into it, this uh, performance profiler uh, you can click on that and note you can do different tests, you know, CPU usage, instrumentation, memory usage. Uh, but since we're interested in CPU usage right here, uh, and then you hit start. And you let that go for a little while. While this is running, remember the, the performance profiler is running in the background right now as we speak, and I want to give it a long, a large, you know, sample size, a large data set um, to get a good idea of of what's what. But while this is running, I want to tell you, um, I wanted to show you the effects of different power profiles um, on our frames per second here, and what I mean by that is if you go to Control Panel. And you go to power options right here. You've got this balanced plan, high performance plan, power saver plan. So normally I could actually click on high performance and you would see my FPS jump like right away. And as soon as I click on balanced again, the FPS would go back down. It's because the high performance power plan disables my dynamic CPU scheduling. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you that in real time on this stream because OBS is running and while OBS is running OBS also disables my um, my dynamic uh, CPU frequency scaling so if I closed OBS my FPS in the game would actually go down because the frequency of my CPU would also come back down and uh, unfortunately I can't do that because if I close OBS then I'll stop broadcasting right or stop recording I just thought it was something really cool and you should go and play with it too uh, just to see what it looks like on your own machine alright we've run that for a while now over a minute and a half so let's see what the um, performance profiler says it's got to collate all the data alright so this will show you uh, where your hottest stuff is like uh, what functions within your program are hottest like in terms of CPU cycles in terms of CPU usage and you know it's got it's like a little flame to show you where where it's burning the most right so and as you can see it's exactly what you would expect you know um, mem copy s uh, blip background to buffer uh, let's see we've got Yep, render frame graphics and then query performance counter. Um, I just want to point this one out. Remember, query performance counter is not is not actually um, the reason why it's on the here is because it's not because it's actually it's not because query performance counter is actually costing us a lot to use. It's because we're calling it so often. Remember, we we call query performance counter um, in a loop really rapidly right down here right we 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 purposely enter a busy loop in order to maintain a like rock solid 60 fps 
And that's not something we could do if we just relied on sleep by itself because the duration of sleep is not predictable. So um, once we get 75% of the way through the frame, then we, we start running our busy loop uh, and we just burn, we're purposely uh, burning the CPU and that is so that we can produce the most accurate result possible. So that there's an explanation for this guy, render frame graphics, that's not a big surprise as to why that's on the hot path. Uh, you click on it and you see, what do we see in here? Yeah, see draw debug info is taking actually a huge amount of CPU and I think that is actually quite telling that um, draw overworld actually takes less time, takes less total CPU than draw debug info. And if you drill down into draw debug info, you can see the the good thing, the things that this will tell you is that printf, like you know, S printf and I to A, those are not the calls that we need to be worried about. The calls that are actually expensive are the blitz string to buffer. And if you drill down into blitz string to buffer, you can see that it looks like the the mem copy is actually what is costing us the most uh, in the context of blistering to buffer. So there you go. And I remember in our last episode there was a question about mem copy versus mem copy s. So this is actually an interesting view that tells us that mem copy s is actually a wrapper around the old-fashioned mem copy so you call mem copy s and it does that buffer checking just to verify that the buffer is not going to overflow and then it just calls mem copy uh, under under the hood right um, anyway i think that's enough performance related junk for right now i don't plan on doing any more um i don't plan on doing any more vectorization uh for the, for the foreseeable future I'm going to close that um, with the exception of if I go to overworld no wait sorry if I go to back to blit 32 bits per pixel bitmap we did the AVX version on camera now the SSE2 ver the SSE2 version is still left to be done um, but I might just do that off camera because it's going to look it's going to end up looking very similar to this um, not identical but similar because remember with each um, uh, with each new version of SIMD they usually add a few new uh, intrinsic functions that that either you know make things more convenient so it's, it's sort of like the older like the further you go back in time to older versions of SIMD like you know AVX2 if you go back to AVX or if you have to go back to SSE2, or if you have to go all the way back to MMX, the further you go back in time, the more, usually the more archaic um, it turns out being, your code turns out being, because you don't have a lot of the newer intrinsics, right? So I'll give you another, I've already, actually already written another example here in um, Blit Background to Buffer. I did write the SSE2 version of it. So if you go down to right here, you go four pixels at a time, and now you'll notice um, something something uh, really interesting here is that I think the SSE2 version <clears throat> uses less, it uses fewer instructions, uh, mainly because I had this unpack high and unpack low um, that did the interleaving of zeros for me. And so I think I actually ended up doing performing fewer operations in the SSE2 version of blit background to buffer than, <coughs> than in the AVX version. Um, but something interesting for study, um, we'll, we'll do that next time. I don't think I'm going to do the SSE2 version of blit 32 BPP bitmap to buffer, um, at least not on camera. So what I wanted to do today is something a little different. I think I wanted to implement the the battle game state. 
which is when you're in the overworld and you're walking around every so often you should randomly encounter an enemy right um which i don't know is bringing up lots of different questions in my mind um in terms of like there are definitely things that we still need to do um i think that like for example do we want the rate of enemy encounters to always be the same like let's say maybe 10 percent so every time you step on a new tile there's a 10 percent chance of you running into a random enemy encounter do we want to have it to where certain areas uh, have a have a larger have a greater like rate of of enemy encounters like maybe over in this area of the world it's 10 percent but maybe over here in this area of the world where it's quote unquote more dangerous it's 30 percent or something like that um also we're going to have a situation where you know let me pull up the world map so we may have a situation where you know well, we definitely will have situations where, like, there's certain types of enemies, and I'm trying to draw with the brush here. Like, over here, you encounter, you know, maybe easy enemies, like, you know, rats and slimes and, you know, easy stuff. But then, like, way down here, you encounter really difficult enemies, like dragons and, and you know, golems and stuff like this that are much tougher. So we're going to have to find, we're going to have to, you know, program in like those different like sub regions I guess you could say because this whole thing is the overworld right but it's not broken down into any sort of like sub regions like maybe this will be sub region one and this will be sub region two and this will be sub region three and each one of these sub regions will have a different they'll have different enemy lists in them right so here you may encounter like this list of enemies and it'll be random and over here you'll encounter a different group of enemies it'll be random things like that so those are all things that are not going to be difficult to do it's just a matter of how exactly we want to implement them um, so as for right now just to get us started let's just go with the 10 percent thing um, I'm going to go to overworld dot C here. Oh, and by the way, that reminds me of something else that I wanted to fix here. Um, there is something that I would consider a bug here that I would like to fix. I just don't know how to fix it yet. This is with these portals. When I walk into this portal and I hold the button down just, just for a, a second, it automatically moves me off of the portal. If you if you notice, if you watch very closely, notice that I I walk into the portal, I will walk into the portal, and then I will lift my hand off of the keyboard. Nevertheless, whenever control is returned to me, as soon as control is as soon as input is re-enabled, my dude starts walking, he walks another tile to the right, as if I had some movement already queued up. And I'm not sure why it works that way, but I don't like it. I want my guy to stay, stay, right, until movement is re-enabled. I, I don't want him to, like, walk an extra tile. So I'll have to figure out how to fix that. Um, but first, let's go into, let's see, this is draw. This is draw. We'll do um, PPI process player input overworld okay and then I think we'll go all the way down here to where we're doing player movement there we go and we get to player movement remaining uh, so this is where we switch uh, G player dot movement remaining when we get to G player movement remaining equals zero there's our portal handler Alright, 
so I think we'll do if else here. The reason why is because if he lands on a portal, I don't want a situation where you land in a portal and you have a monster encounter at the same time. So I think that's why this needs to be an if or else situation. Else, then we do another check. Um, so how are we going to do a 10%? We need to we need to basically roll a dice. We, we need to roll a die and do a, do a check on like 10%. So how do we do that? Um, obviously, I think everybody knows, even, even, even programming beginners probably know um, that rand is not random. I mean, it's not really, it, not only is it not random, but it's like really, really, really not random. And it's, it's pretty terrible to use. Now, in, I mean, in a game, you might be able to get away with it. You know, but um, definitely, if you're writing any sort of like production quality code, you know you can't you can't use Rand because it's extremely predictable. And in fact, I think even even in a video game, we should strive to do better. So if you're you know if you're using like I think there's an S Rand that's a little bit more secure. I think there's also a rand underscore s, which is probably what I'll end up using. Um, it generates a pseudo random number, and it's called a pseudo random number because your your CPU is deterministic, and it cannot generate random numbers. You, in order to generate a truly random number, you need some sort of analog input from the real world like you have to measure cosmic background radiation or you have to measure barometric pressure in Spain or something you know you need you need analog input from the real world your CPU is a completely digital device that doesn't have any sort of uh, it doesn't have an analog signal um, at least not any CPU that I know of that will get you pure randomness so uh, but this rand s function will get a decent a decent decently random number a decently random pseudo random number right it's better than the regular rand function at any rate so it looks like we need std lib and we also have to define this weird thing here by default, this function's global state is scoped to the application. To change this, C, global state in the CRT, um, I think that the rele the reason why that's relevant is that um, you don't want multiple applications, you don't want multiple processes on the same box having the same global state, right? Because then you could one process could potentially predict the outcome of rand underscore s in another application, right? So you could have potentially one application that is hostile and could be spying on another application. You don't you don't want that. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna go and do this. I'm gonna define this thing. I guess I'm gonna define it way up here. And then I need to include stdlib.h. Although stdlib might already have been included in something else like windows.h, so let me go check first and make sure that I don't already have access to it. I may not actually have to include stdlib.h specifically. There. 
So now a random should hold some random value. And somewhere in the range from 0 to all Fs. It's a 32-bit random number. The RandS function uses the operating system to generate cryptographically secure random numbers. It does not use the seed generated by the SRAND function, nor does it affect the number sequence used by RAND. See, it's a different function And it uses RTL gen random, which is basically the the, secu the the function that Windows itself uses to generate securely random numbers for basically all you know security related stuff. So I think it is relatively trustworthy. Like I said, it's still pseudo random. It's not true random, but it's close enough. So wait, it said did it say the input can't be zero? If the input pointer is null, no, it's not null. It's a okay. Because it's not a, I'm not giving it a pointer, I'm giving it an actual I'm giving it an actual thing, an object, so it's a D word, right? It's not a pointer, so I don't think that applies to us. All right, so what do we want to do? Okay, so I guess we want to make this into sort of a 10% thing, right? Where is my percent sign? So uh, this is mod, you know, modulo arithmetic, and um, essentially it 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 caps it to whatever number is over here. It's saying, um, you know, I want the result to be whatever the remainder is if when you divide this thing by ten, and it's going to get a get us a number between. 1 and 10, right? Now, I will say that there there is an issue with doing this too. If you are programming something that is, that needs to be secure, that need, you know, if you're writing software for a banking, you know, if you're writing some sort of like banking software or, you know, cryptography that needs to be secure, um, I want you to know that I, I'm fully aware that there is a problem with this method too. The problem is is that modulo arithmetic has it has a bias to it, where it is biased to select um, numbers like on the very edge of the spectrum a little bit more. Now, for the purposes of a video game, I think that the bias is not really going to be noticeable. I don't think that it's going to have any effect in the real world but like I said if you're doing something that needs to be truly cryptographically secure then you need to go the extra mile here and do something like um, you know you need to basically you know discard uh, say you need to either you know discard samples to to offset the bias um, or something to that effect but for now uh, Should we run into a random monster encounter? All right. If oh, you know what? Let's do let's do one hundred.
Yeah, so basically if the number is between 91 and 100, then we will run into a monster. I think that's right. And again, we'll have to, you know, turn this into a variable at some point because we're, you know, we may want this value to change depending on where you are in the world. Maybe monsters will be, um, it'll be more likely for you to run into a monster in, in different areas or maybe like in a dungeon or something like this. Um, also, we may want to, um, maybe there'll be like a spell you can cast or maybe, oh, maybe if you have like a, like a, a sneak value or maybe if you put on like a invisibility cloak or something that makes you uh, invisible to monsters, you know what I'm saying, that, that will have to, we'll have to change this. Um, but let's just try to get it working at a constant 10% right now. Um, random monster encounter. Okay, I'm going to main.h and define or declare this uh, function. And I guess this function will go in overworld since a random monster encounter could only happen in the overworld, right? So, so it would only make sense. All right, and now let's see what happens. Um, I'm going to set a breakpoint on it right there. Now we'll see if it uh, feels. We'll see if it feels like it's about ten percent. All right, we hit our breakpoint. Sorry, I had to. I had to preemptively restart OBS there because I noticed that the. I felt like there was a CPU spike here when I hit this breakpoint, and uh, CPU spikes have a tendency of messing up the audio, uh, making the audio get really glitchy in OBS. So I just preemptively restarted the recording. All right. Anyway, so there's our random monster encounter. Let's go back. I don't know. I don't know if that was accurate. So, what do we do when we're not sure if things are working correctly? We add it to the debug output. So basically, I think if I add something to the debug output to give me uh, this number, that'll tell me, hey look, uh, the value says 95 here, but I didn't encounter a monster, so what gives? D word equals zero. Also, why do I get differs in indirection slightly to D word pointer? Why is it telling me that? I mean, it is an unsigned. Oh, is it because the rand s function takes an unsigned int, but the d word is an unsigned long, even though on this platform longs and ints are the same? Probably. Yeah, there was nothing wrong with the code. It's just I'm just trying to please the compiler so that it doesn't warn me. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm really not encountering any monsters here. What about 50%? And also, let's make sure my breakpoint is still set. Oh, I didn't, my breakpoint wasn't set. Yeah, of course, now it works fine. Alright, stop. Let's see. We'll do greater than or equal to 90. So right now we have a 10% chance of running into a monster. Uh, okay, so random monster encounter, what is it going to do? It's going to do G current game state equals, um, wait, G previous game state equals G current game state, and G current game state equals game state battle nice now we need to implement this and back in main.c we'll go to render frame graphics and we need to implement this game state. We'll do, we'll do so right here. Game state battle. Oh, it's already here. Sorry. Draw. Declare this. Uh, I'll put it with the other. Ah, that's right. Time to make a new header file and a new C file. New item. I'm going to call it. Battle.c. Add. I'm going to create a new header file and I'm going to call it battle.h. Go to main.h. Include battle.h. that are specific to the battle game state. Okay. And then get an example of the kind of stuff I put in here. Yeah. There we go. Obviously, I'm going to have a PPI battle as well. C. I'll go back to main.c. I'll go to process player input and I will modify 
this switch case accordingly. PPI bow. Perfect. And then battle.c. I think um, the only thing I'm going to do here is Why is it giving me a hard time about this? Am I leaving something out? Why is it giving me a hard time about this? All right, destination is G back buffer. Oh, okay. Um, hold on a second. to battle.h that is why it was giving me a hard time about it all right destination g back buffer dot memory the value is going to be um, no clue, I'm just making some color, and then the size D count will be game drawing area memory size. I'm just going to clear the screen to some color just to see if it works. Oh, and in PPI battle, I'm going to say if G input uh, if um, if what's what did I call it? G player input game input um, escape key is down and not G game input escape key was down. Then I'm going to go back to overworld g previous game state equals g current game state and g current game state equals game state over world just for testing purposes all right let's see what happens Take the break. Oh, exception thrown. Divided by four. All right? Divided by size of D word. Let's try that. Hey. 
There we go. So every time, every 10% of the time, I encounter some weird uh, a random monster encounter, and then it turns the screen into a crazy lime green color. Um, so I think that's all the programming that I'm going to do today. I just wanted to get that game state implemented. Um, but for next time, I have I do have something to think about here, and I'm going to go to uh, YouTube. All right, let's try to find a battle. There we go. All right, I want to look, and I, I don't. I want to see if I want to emulate. Let me turn the volume down. Okay. Did you see how that sort of transition there? And then the background is actually still here, and then we just get a small sort of like. Uh, inlaid frame here that sort of gives us a another cool little background um, and then the, it, it draws the enemy right in the center and I think that looks cool I mean on the downside it gives me more art that I have to draw and as you can tell I'm not like the best artist in the world so um, it is a little bit intimidating because it's more art to draw um, now keep okay so keep this in mind but on the other hand, uh, contrast this with uh, the other type of encounter where I'll try to find I'll try to find an example here where we get to like when you're inside of a dungeon or in a cave or whatever, it just blacks out the entire screen. This is a lot easier for me because that means I don't have to draw that sort of like artwork uh, in the background. Now, also if you go to Dragon Warrior Two, if you go to Dragon Warrior Two, I think all of the enemy encounters are of the latter variety where it just blacks out the entire screen like that right there in Dragon Warrior 2 you had the you could actually have more than one enemy you could encounter multiple enemies at once though um, which is kind of a, an upgrade so anyway I just wanted to show you that because I wanted you want you to be thinking about which which type um, of enemy encounter, do we want? Do we want this to look like? Um, and I think that probably the reason why they went this way, even though Dragon Warrior Two was a sequel to Dragon Warrior One, and when you think you know sequels are supposed to be better, right? So why would they have like reverted to just blanking out the entire screen? And I think it's probably it was probably due to hardware limitations. Right, it was probably like if they they wanted like four creatures on the screen, so there's like more memory that they had to uh, account for um, to like update the statistics of every one of these creatures, and then like they had the graphics of like maybe uh, for some reason we can only draw right here in the center, and then that would make it look weird because these other creatures would um, be stretched off to the sides um, of, uh, and they were like. Be, go outside the bounds of, of our background that we were drawing and so what I'm saying is there's probably a good reason other than just laziness why they had to go back to just drawing a blank screen um, we however have no such hardware restrictions and we can do whatever whatever we want so you know we could draw a background um, that's probably what we'll do. Anyway, I'm just brainstorming, just thinking out loud. Uh, but that's all the time we have uh, for today, so I'm going to go ahead and call it. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this uh, video and you enjoy watching along as I develop this game, then please like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends. Also, don't forget that we have a companion GitHub repository so you can follow along at home. Lastly, if you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to leave your comments or questions on the video and I will address any interesting questions or comments in an upcoming episode. It doesn't have to be about this episode, it can be about any previous episode. I'm always happy to address any, um, any viewer comments or questions. Alright, with that, 
I, that's all I have for today. I will see you guys in a few days. Uh, thanks again for watching. Bye.